What's up, y'all? What's How happening? Come on, ça va. Come on, ça va. Call me, ça va. Call me, ça va. That's what you say, right? Yeah, that's what I say. I try to do it. I try to do it for the, like the out of staters, just to make fun of it, because you, get, you know, somebody come up to you, hey, you're DJ Rec. Call me, ça va. <laughs> and I'm like, no, that's not how you say it. But oh boy, they try. <laughs> at least you're trying. They try. But uh, you guys are trying. I mean, uh, I mean, Bayou Wild TV. It's coming along nicely. The last couple of years, you guys have kind of splashed on the scene with Mr. Don Debut. Tell me about. Tell me how it all came together. I mean, I know that's a loaded question, but let's just start with who y'all are and how did this magical thing come together? I'm the foreigner here. Um, I worked at WGNO in New Orleans for three years, and I was not quite pleased with my career. And I met Don at his alma mater, Rummel, at, at a uh, Beast Feast. So it kind of was destiny, I think, in that point, because I was introduced to him, and I talked about kind of where I was in the news industry and I wasn't happy and I wanted to stay in the outdoor world, but I still loved working in media. So a few months after that, you know, he had approached me and Chris about starting a new show. They had worked together for several years um, with Paradise Louisiana. And uh, over the course of the next six months, we just brainstormed and came up with an idea to do something a little different than a typical hunting, fishing show that's pushing products and ranches and Techniques wherever. And- yeah, not just the your how to bolts, where to. You know, it's not the nuts and bolts of the outdoors. Right. Yeah, I mean, that's what I like about the show is because um, it, it relates to so many people. You, you don't really take it serious, but you do take it serious. You know what I'm saying? And I think people can relate to that. They kind of like, they're a little bit more open-minded to be like, hey, I'm not really an outdoorsman. Right. But these people are just like me. You know what I'm saying? They're not like all like, yeah, on this episode, we're going to go out and shoot. Them. You know, like yeah. you, a lot of people feel intimidated by that. And that's what I like about y'all show. Well, I've only lived in Louisiana for six years, but I kind of dove in head first and I was getting introduced to fishing and hunting before Bayou Wild. Where are you originally from? I grew up in Connecticut. Oh, okay. but I've oh lived, northern. I've lived here. in the Yankee. South. Really north. <laughs> I've lived in the South for 18, 19 years now, but Bayou Wild, I'm kind of the experiment here because a lot of the things that we've done on the show were my first time doing a lot of these things. So I want to show other people that no matter how old you are, male, female, kid, senior citizen, that the outdoors is accessible to everybody. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that has been filmed. A lot of my first deer, my first tuna, my first whatever has all been done on camera, which I guess I'm just comfortable having a camera around and doing it now. But what we get a lot of response from is people that um, I've had so many people say, you know, I'm interested in doing this and I was too intimidated to try. But then I saw your show and that looked like so much fun and mm-hmm. it wasn't as scary anymore. So that's well, kind of what I'm saying. position, too, of Don's done it all. He's right. been he's been in it for right. decades. Right. So to see the difference of her who's experiencing a lot of this for the first time and his experience of doing it his whole life. It's right. really it's really cool to see that come together. Now, for those who don't know who Don Dubuque is, he's kind of like the little outdoor sportsman legend around here, yeah. kind of local Bayou guy. Uh, he started off, uh, what, WWL TV long years he's ago? He's actually had his radio program for 33 years now. Yeah. Okay, all so right. So he's been doing Don it's the, the longest, out- Yeah, the longest yeah. running uh, outdoor show, I think, in Louisiana. Probably yeah. so. Yeah. And he airs so. in like 32 states on his radio show. God knows his stuff. So, oh, he does, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, and then he's got in the TV also, mm-hmm. and... That's how Don and I started working together was a Paradise, Louisiana TV it's, show. It's kind of funny how Don entered the... He entered the outdoor world around the same age as me in terms of um, media. He mm-hmm. obviously hunted and fished his whole life. Right. He was unhappy in a career field in middle age, had three children. He took a huge leap of faith and started doing radio first, and then that graduated to television. So I feel like we have a lot of commonalities. Right. I'm like his next generation of what he did. Mm-hmm. So it's been really fun working with him and Chris. I mean, we feel like family. We're all totally different, but we all bring a different piece to it. Mm-hmm. And um, people are surprised that I'm so new to all this stuff, but I just I just can't see myself not outside anymore. Right. Now, so did it start up at an early age, your your love for the outdoors in Connecticut? Yeah, I mean, my, my what love, is in Connecticut well, that you can shoot and eat with rice? I didn't do <laughs> the hunting. I did fish as a kid. My dad had an offshore boat, um, but I took a really long hiatus from that for years. I was always an outdoors person. I was a huge surfer. I mm-hmm. always lived on the coast, so I always was near the ocean. I love boats, um, but I didn't get back into the hunting fishing game really until about 2015. 
And then I was doing a little segment for my news channel there called uh, Fishtails that I aired on Fridays. And that's how I got introduced to so many of these inshore guides in Southeast Louisiana, cold calling them. They had no idea who I was. And I convinced <laughs> them to take me out and go on these adventures. And that's really kind of how I met Don, too. Um, so I had a mild introduction to it before Bayou Wild, but it just, I'm also now a charter captain. So right. I work offshore now. So it's kind of like my whole world just evolved into the outside. It's awesome. Yeah. Now what, Chris, you went to school for the video side of everything? Yeah, communications. Okay. Yeah. So you went to LSU? Southeastern. Southeastern. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, no, you, you do some stuff for LSU though, right? The, yeah, uh, I do work for SEC Network. And the SEC Network. Yeah. That's, that's where I got the confusion from. Okay, so cool. So you you love working with cameras, imagery, all of that your whole life? Yeah, Kind of like what, so. <laughs> me. I mean, you I love doing that. You and I talked about this before. Right. It seems like as early as I could, I was taking mom and dad's big VHS video camera and right. putting it on my shoulder and doing fun stuff around the house with it. Yeah. And it wasn't until like my second year of college that I realized, wait, you can make a career out of this? Yeah. What is that? What does he, that mean? He's the best, y'all. He's <laughs> the best. I mean, and the camera work is great. And the degree is more journalism. You know, right. They don't teach you really production in, in schools. No, I think that, that the production value is just a knack that somebody naturally has. And I think that's why it's like kind of like a, a marriage made in heaven, a little match. All yeah. you guys kind of coming we, together. We would be nowhere without Chris. Chris does not get near the accolades he should because if you've seen any of the videos he's produced, whether a teaser, a full episode... Um, an outtake of, you know, a little extra for YouTube. Mm -hmm. The the camera work blows my mind every time. I mean, right. I text him after I see a show, and I'm just like, where did you get that idea? I don't because, know either. Yeah. Well, we, we had talked about <laughs> one of the challenges in our field as in general is that it's hard to set yourself apart when everyone's got a camera now. Right. And everyone thinks that they're a camera person. Yes. And you have to take it to another level. You have to have the ability to tell a story yes. with a camera. Right. Not right. only just narration and not only, you know, the subject matter of what you're doing. You have to figure out, okay, when I get out there, yes, we're fishing, but how can I make it interesting? Because if you just put the camera on and, you know, film someone fishing, it's not going to hold, someone's, not hold someone's attention. You have to story tell, and it not only has to do with the content, it has to do with the imagery. Like, you have to... So I know you probably rack your brains because I do. When I'm out there, I'm like, okay, what kind of shot can I get? What kind, what you know? Because I see it's the last time. We, a yeah, lot of times. it is. I mean, you constantly have to be thinking. People, you probably hear it too. You're so lucky you hunt and fish for a living. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, I'm there, and I mean, I do. Right. Love the fact that I'm not in a newsroom or something like that. And my career could have taken me a lot of different places, but. It's it is a lot of work sometimes mm -hmm. to just constantly it's a ton of work be, because constantly be thinking there's yeah. certain segments that I have filmed for a show. You know, we're all different places. Chris lives an hour from me and we go on different trips that are just personal trips. But we always try and bring a camera. And I didn't really. I used to do some camera work for my news stations, but I didn't fully appreciate how much time goes into it until I brought a camera on a trip and tried to film as much stuff. And my brain is just constantly going like. Tight shot, wide shot, narrow shot, mm -hmm. moving shot. What am I missing? And I, I might think I have enough video, and it's nowhere near what he needs. So right. he has constantly got the gears turning. That's what, never enough. Well, and, and, you know, we were talking about that when we went film out there. A lot of people, when they call you, hey, I want to do a little minute project, you know, whatever, a little minute thing to put on social media. Okay, you quote them, and they're like, ow. What? You know, and he's like, no, that's how much it costs. And then they don't realize that. For one minute of content, you really need like four or five hours oh, yeah. of filming. Tons of video. You know what I'm yeah. saying? It's not just you turning can never the camera have too much. On. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I know and you then, rack your brains for and that. And then you edit also. Yes. So not only are you out there in the field and you're thinking about different shots, but you're already your brain's already thinking of how these shots gonna work together. Right. You're sort of pre editing what you're doing while we, you're doing we put it, so. cameras in the air, we've put cameras underwater. And I'm not just talking two feet underwater. We've literally attached cameras to people swimming down to oil rigs. I mean, there's right. no limits for, for what you can do. Well, and then sometimes you have ideas that don't work out. You know, I'll put a lot of thought into, oh, this would be really cool. Uh -huh. And you take the effort to make the shot work. Right. And you go and look at it like, eh, and it's not really going to work on no, TV. Yeah, yeah. And you just it, trash it. it. You delete <laughs> and you might never see it again. Exactly. Nobody knew this existed. Did I see that scene? Um, it was a little promo or something a little teaser for season six and it was somebody going down 
That, so that's a GoPro you put on, put on them? That yeah, was probably a GoPro. Um, oh, that was me at the Springs, probably. Yeah, somebody. It looked like a rig again. with barnacles. Oh, it was yeah. blue yeah. and it was going down. Oh, that was actually something I had shot um, several years ago. I'm a free diver, so okay. I, when the weather, when the water's clear, I would tell my friends to put a camera on. But some of the best video I think we've gotten that's really pushed us to another level has been Chris's drone footage. Mm-hmm. I mean, we have gotten whale, oh, whales in Alaska. I mean, just. Birds, you know, in Stuttgart, like just incredible stuff. There's so many different things you could do with a drone. I mean, back in the day, you have to pay ten thousand dollars and a permit to get right. a helicopter right. up in the air to get the perfect scene you wanted. Nowadays, I mean, you just send the drone up and just make sure you're <laughs> not in a no-fly zone. Yeah, yeah. If you don't want to, fl- no, don't fly in a no-fly zone. You know, you got to make get sure the you know the stuff. laws when it comes to nature. Well, there's nothing that will bust your bubble more in production whenever you. Thinking you're going to a location, you're ready to use a drone, and, you, and you send it up, and you're in a no-fly zone. Yeah, exactly. Or you're in a restricted area, or whatever. You know, exactly. that I'll never especially forget. in Louisiana. There, I mean, there's airports all over the everywhere. Coast in One of the funniest so drone situations. I gotta tell this anecdote. We were in Homer, Alaska, <laughs> two years ago, mm-hmm. and I mean, if you've ever been to Alaska, everything is a postcard there. Like, right. It's beautiful, and we're at, eating lunch after a fishing trip. Chris puts his drone up as he always does, and uh, you know, if we don't know where Chris is, we're like, oh, he's flying the drone. <laughs> you know and walking he, around with a camera somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. So he's in the parking lot with the drone, and he's flying it around, and and he's taking a little longer than he normally does. And I walk up to him. I was like, everything okay? He goes, I can't find my drone. <laughs> he flew it so far away, he didn't know where it was. Because <laughs> oh, no. he got carried away looking at the, the mountains yeah, and the oh, scenery. And you can't this. really hit home yeah. because it's too far away. Yeah. Or like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He got it back. It's <laughs> not nearly as advanced as the one oh, I had. This okay. was the early right. days, but it was pretty, <laughs> I can't find my drone. <laughs> I mean, and like she said, everything is so scenic. Right. So I'm flying around. I'm like, oh, that looks cool. I'm going to go fly and look at that. I'm going to go, go look, look at, at this. this. But then everything really looks the same. Like, you know, oh, when absolutely. you're starting to scan. You're and like then you're like, like I don't follow. know where I am. <laughs> you're like, where is the drone? And then it was far enough away to where I couldn't hear it. You couldn't right. see it or hear it. So. And then I just kept going in circles trying to figure out, all right, what's a building around me that I can or, <laughs> A boat next that seagull to me looks that like the other seagull, so don't look at that. <laughs> and while you're doing we're, that. At a, we're at a marina with a thousand boats at it. They all look the same for right. a couple hundred feet in the air. Yeah, and you add it, you're trying to hurry up and land it, and it's boop, you better land in five minutes. Yeah, battery's, battery's going to die. It did come back, <laughs> Yeah, luckily. <laughs> it came back. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, because, man, that, that makes me nervous. The first time I ever flew a drone, it was uh, one of the GoPro like ones. Oh, Try yeah. flying one in the Gulf when you're trying corner. to land it on a oh, boat. Oh, man. <laughs> I was like, I was nervous just flying it in my backyard. Yep. I'm going to hit my house. I'm yep. going to hit my house. But, yes, it does really get amazing drone scenes. Like, one of the scenes that I saw, uh, there was a film producer on, I forgot his name, it's escaping me, but he's got like 4 million subscribers, and he kind of does the fishing thing too. Well, he made a little movie a couple of weeks ago, and he posted it. He came down, and he fished in Kokodri, mm-hmm. and they had this drone shot. It was coming down. It was right on top of the boat, and you can see the redfish in the water, yeah. and he just he throws it, and the guy running the drone is telling him, hey, uh, all right, just move a little bit this way, move a little bit to the right, and you can see the redfish yeah. come up, boom, get it. Dude, it was one of the most beautiful shots I've ever seen in my life. Actually, seeing it gives the you another angle up. that you just can't get. Man, on. Yeah, yeah, it's just and it's beautiful too. Mm-hmm. So, but uh, talking about the show, what's the weirdest thing? The one of the weirdest things that's ever happened to y'all on the show, or right, one of the most interesting characters you brought on the show. Now I went on the show a couple of, but I'm sure y'all had some way more interesting. <laughs> well, characters I can think than of me. a few characters. One that jumps out at me is Chef Philippe Parola. <laughs> he, is he is a, a French character. chef, and he is very memorable. His whole mantra is, if you can't beat it, eat it. And what that means is he specializes in taking invasive species and finding ways to market them. Trying to commercialize it as a a marketable food source. He's obsessed with Asian carp. The flying fish. The flying that, fish that, that come out. The wall. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And so we we went out, and he wanted to show us how bad they were. And we went out on a boat. Are with they him. invasive to like a oh, like a yeah. Nutra? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And he is just if you've seen any of the shows with him, you'll know who I'm talking about because he cooked the Nutria on the show. He cooked the carp on the show. But he's extremely passionate, and he's you know got this accent, and he's very just, strong. Parisian French, not Cajun French, oh, okay. but Parisian French. Yeah, okay. he's French French, but everybody who knows him... Je ne sais pas ce quoi le menu. He... A yeah. bit... Plus. Plus. <laughs> <laughs> he's got a great idea, too. I mean, it's just very hard to market because of the whole FDA regulations and that sort of thing. Yeah. But he... We went out and filmed with him on a boat where we were zapping the carp, meaning sticking the electronic stuff in the water to make them jump. And right. one of them jumped in the boat and hit me while I was recording with the camera. 30-pound fish. I mean, yeah. you've seen those YouTube videos. I've where, heard people get knocked out. Oh, yeah. yeah. 
Mm-hmm. And that was that was pretty funny. Who do you have? Well, I think one of our most requested shows of last year was DJ Red. Oh, <laughs> no. Nah, stop uh, it. <laughs> no, it was. A lot of people enjoyed it. Well, the, we the, had the, fun with it. And I well, think the one thing about me, when I get out there, I'm so improv. So, if so, like, uh, the whole squatting with the alligator thing, I thought of that on the spot. Like, yeah. it just... I. I it's just know. it's authentic though with you. I mean, it, it yeah. comes off like I'm not doing this to produce a show. I'm just this is just funny. This right. Is just but what I, I think do. what we stress on that show is that it is supposed to be fun. It's supposed to I be. I mean, a the fun people thing. that's never been alligator hunting, but only know it from swamp all these swamp people on these right. other shows. It's not really that exciting. They think it's like so suspenseful, like you hunting dinosaurs. Yeah, it's, it's not yeah. as intimidating as it looks. It's not that bad. I mean, but it, it is fun. But it is fun. It yeah, is, yeah, exactly. It's like the it's it, it's hunting. It's, it's the something thrill of you the can't chase. do in so many places. You know, it's like one of the things people think. Of. I mean, if there's one animal in Louisiana, people think about it, it's an alligator. I yeah, mean, mm-hmm. they but think I, it's the I biggest would, novelty ever. I would say going back, if we don't get too far off a tangent, going back to. One of the craziest characters we had, Big Frida. Uh, yes. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And unfortunately, we Martha weren't and I able to be there that day. There. Oh. It was Don with his WWL camera. Oh, guy. okay, all right. Um, well, was, yeah, I think I saw that because um, uh, Sheba Turk, I think Sheba was Turk. There yeah, too. she she helped coordinate it because she was doing a series for her um, WWL morning where she takes New Orleans people and puts them in an awkward situation oh, or something. Okay. So. She so reached that was out the to us and said, I want to put Big Frida in an outdoor <laughs> situation. So we start racking our brains mm-hmm. and said, Garfish. Why not a Garfish? Right. Big Craziest garfish. looking thing Where ever. was that? Because them Garfish is like, like, you look like you could just grab them out of the water. I mean, it's yeah, crazy. It was an undisclosed location. Undisclosed. <laughs> <laughs> Neighborhood location. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, One more I know those spots. That wasn't, you know, so over the top. That's a favorite of mine. His name is Dutch Prager. He is 96 years old as of December. And he is the founder of the New Orleans Big Game Fishing Club. This man was catching marlin and tuna before it was cool. I mean, he, seven miles out of South Pass. So he founded the fishing club that's still there in Venice today. And he's known, we call him the man of the marsh because he, in his later years, you know, he hasn't been offshore in 20 years, but he pioneered offshore fishing in Louisiana and then transitioned in his later life to marsh fishing. And he's very good friends with Captain Mike Gallo, who, Angling Adventures of Louisiana, and um, we got to go in the marsh with him at 95 years old, and he is just a gem. I mean, he is so sharp and so – he's 96 years old, and we went two hours away in a 26-foot boat mm. and caught redfish with him. And that was a memory, like, I feel blessed to have met him. Mm. So he's one of my favorite characters, too. Nice. Yeah, and to hear him talking about, you know, just his entire life of fishing. Mm-hmm. It's pretty impactful. I love those stories. The old people just How sit down and How many generations are in 96 years, you know? Right, you think right. about that. Uh, I don't know. South Louisiana, you can you squeeze a few Quite of them a in few, there. Quite a few, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on where you're at. What, right. what time Legally you're or illegally, I don't <laughs> know. But, <laughs> but yeah, no, uh, I've uh, I've heard of families having like six, seven generations. Like, it, yeah, it's kind of weird, but... Um, that's what we do down here. We love That's each other. That's why you start naming them T and Lil T and all <laughs> yeah. sorts of stuff. Yeah. Everybody's yeah. T and Trey and everybody's the same. But the fifth. Uh, so, so uh, Bayou Wild. Uh, when did y'all? What, what, what was the first episode? When did y'all start? What year did it start? We technically started filming in 2017, 2017. but it didn't premiere until twenty eighteen. Okay. Um, we filmed our first episode a week before my birthday in December twenty seventeen in Mississippi. What an awesome trip that was. We went to the Sanctuary Lodge in Mississippi, in Woodville. I had never killed a deer. And we spent, what, two days hunting, trying to find the right one. And uh, on the last day we were there, after we successfully did that, and caught me crying on camera. You know? Hi-yow! Oh, yeah. Oh, talk about ner- I'd never had more of a nervous moment with a camera in my tense. face. It took me, like, seven minutes to shoot this deer. Now, look, I've... <laughs> I've never shot a deer before. I was terrified. I've always gone to, you know, I've gone to the deer camp and sit down and just, uh, it's just, but it's I not got to for have, me. I, I mean, that, I, I got understand Chris and Don it, but, with me. So that was cool. We were all together for that right. moment. That was and really so, our first so time. It really, yeah. So y'all really get yeah. nervous, like, because I'm not going to experience that. I, well, I don't think, think of I added pressure. That. I mean, most people in Louisiana, not most, but hunters, people that hunt here were probably nine, 10 years old when they did this. And mm-hmm. I was 32 or something. So, right. and then I have a camera crew with me. And camera crew. So and the it was the mounts. last hunt. It was the last hunt of the trip. It was dust. You got to get it now. It's like you better do this. Don't mess it <laughs> Crunch up. Crunch time. And then yeah. the coolest part of that, we never in a million years would have predicted this to happen, and that's ironic because I'm a meteorologist, or I was by trade. But 
on our last morning there. You'll remember this weekend because it was 2017 December when it snowed. Yep. I remember that. I have we, some video We woke of that. up in Woodville to five inches of snow on the ground. Wow. Yeah, we just had a little bit on the ground, though. But like it was a, a big snowman, deal. It was, that's yeah. about it. But the further north you went in Louisiana, right. and even in southeast Louisiana, there was accumulation. And mm-hmm. that was, we got to film a Christmas you yeah. know, episode yeah, outro. in Louisiana. So what a pilot episode, right? Yeah, right, I mean, how, right. you set First the bar there. First camera, get snow. a bitter end, and then we get a snow. Yeah. <laughs> it happens once every 10 years, yeah. and we got it. it yeah. was, that was a good, a, a good, um, that was like a good kickoff. A off. good message. Now, not everything has worked that way. No. no, 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 no. We've had <laughs> no. years where we're like, God, we should just leave the camera at home. <laughs> Look, and I mean, uh, we do the Y'all Catching Show. We've only got like six episodes, so I can understand. You guys, how many episodes are y'all going on? 103. Now? Yeah, right? okay. I, that blows my mind because I know how much went into the six episodes we do. So you guys, I mean, I know the troubles you could run into. I mean, tell me a nightmare story of a camera that you filmed all day and probably didn't get the footage when you done. The, the first alligator hunt we did, we had yeah. some problems. Yeah, the first alligator hunt we did, it rained the entire time. Mm-hmm. And I didn't bring a uh, raincoat for the camera. So I have a garbage bag wrapped around the camera <laughs> trying to film as much as I can and Guess not get it wet. Right. Well, it gets wet enough to where it's not working. Oh, and then we no. had a, uh, we did a shrimping excursion. Oh, mm-hmm. yeah, that was a, a wet one. a guy in, uh, around the Hopedale area that takes people on shrimping excursions. Biblical rains on this trip. It, it, tremendous downpour. <laughs> I mean, it was beautiful morning. We rode out, pretty, pretty sunrise, right. slow boat ride. When it's time to pull in the shrimp nets in, get out of the torrential cover. downpour, <laughs> and I'm standing in like a little bitty corner of the boat trying not to get the camera wet. Well, it right. gets so wet it stops working. Stops working. So Can I tell the story? I resort to a GoPro <laughs> to film <laughs> yeah. most of that. Yeah. Episode. You gotta it do came what out you gotta good. Do. It was good. Can I tell the story about the squirrel hunt? Go for it. <laughs> this <laughs> Why not? Because it's so great, and you're such a professional. <laughs> we went to Luling. We were just up the road, and we went on a squirrel hunt with dogs. And it's wet, you know, swampy, mm-hmm. kind of two inches of water, walk around your mud boots. And we're towards the tail end of the hunt. We're hunting with dogs. So the dogs find the squirrels. We follow the dogs. Well, there was a ditch. And thankfully, this was at the end of our hunt. I think we had been done shooting. We were walking back. And these dogs jumped this ditch. And Chris, what was it, a turtle shell you saw? He saw an empty turtle shell. And he's got a little voice. So he said, I'm going to go get that for, for Dean. Mm-hmm. Well, he sees the dogs run the way of the turtle shell. And they kind of just levitate over this ditch. So well, it was wet. We were in flooded woods right. the whole day. We were yeah. walking around in ankle deep water we the just, entire day. It's just water. You didn't think anything of it. Well, Chris takes a step, <laughs> and <laughs> I don't know where this hole came from, but he went up to his shoulders, <laughs> like like quicksand, <sighs> up to here with a camera in his hand and oh a backpack. Oh my! So he shoots his hand up in the air with his camera like a true professional. And Don't try like this a, at home. Like I the jerk that I am, I just can't stop laughing. I mean, he is to the shoulders. You know, what's the um, stand by me with the leeches? You know, oh, that's yeah. all I can yeah. think about. And yeah. he's <laughs> up to his shoulders camera in, in, the air, in the air with one hand and treading water yeah. with the other hand oh, just keep my, myself man. afloat. My, oh, my Sca- that must be hurt. scary, huh? Like, <laughs> he was, you know, uh, also being the true professional that he is, he had to change of clothes in his car. So. Oh man, no! Nah, I would. I got kids. You got to keep changing oh. clothes. Well, I got kids too, but I don't do that. <laughs> but yours are a little more grown. I still <laughs> yeah. had a baby at the time. Oh, oh I, I got was like Father of the year. <laughs> oh yeah, yes. you, I mean, you got for those. Bleh, yeah, yeah, that happens all the time. It was. It was. So how you got out? I, Sort of Take the out. camera. Yeah. Pulled Somebody grabbed out. the camera, but see, Don had a smaller camera in his other hand, and he didn't film me going in, but you hear all the commotion. Oh. Like he had it running, just kind of pointing <laughs> at someone the hill. So you hear the, <laughs> get the camera, get the camera. And then, I'll never it forget that. It was a great that. moment. Was, I, bet, I bet you. It was you, fun. It was a better moment for me than <laughs> I bet you could probably make a whole season on blooper reels, probably. We yeah. do. A lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, end of year blooper reel every. Oh, man. Yeah, we have a. We didn't do it this past year because of, or this past month. We usually in January uh-huh. have a get together with all of the captains and all, a lot of the people that we do shows with, and we have a blooper party. Unedited. Oh, kind of talk about yeah. what happened and oh, stuff. You just, it's a whole 30 minutes. Unrestrained just blooper party. We just take that... all the bloopers, I put them together in a 25, 30 minute video. Uh-huh. Cuss words, everything that's, else. And that's the best. The bloopers are probably the best part yeah, of it. And, we, and yeah. you know, we have a far TV version of the bloopers, right. but then we have an unedited version at this little private party, yeah. and it's a, it's beep, a beep. lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> and unfortunately, we couldn't have it this past right. year because of because of, of COVID. Because of the COVID. Oh man. 
Y'all about over this COVID crap? I've been over it. Yeah, man. Been and you know it. what? It's good. The stuff that you guys do is like you're in the outdoors, so it's kind of we kinda are helped lucky. Y'all. We, we are lucky that we still were able to do a lot, but we did end up we canceled more things than I thought we would have to. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, um, we didn't get to go to Alaska this year. That was a huge bummer. Um, mm-hmm. We do that every summer, and uh, there was a lot of trips that just didn't materialize because we didn't know what was going on. So, mm-hmm. but the beauty of the outdoors is it is your safe spot. I mean, there's it, if you watch, I guess now is a good time to plug the premiere, the new season. Yeah, well, it's kind of what we were talking about. It. Yeah, it's kind of uh, what this new season is going to be about. Is we had a lot of trips in the last year that haven't aired yet, right? But they kind of reiterate that the outdoors is a it's a safe place. It's the place to be. A lot in of a times time like you're this. away yeah. from people. Mm-hmm. You're away from politics. You're away from social media. You're away from all this other stuff. It's right. your it's way to get out. Stress free, so. safe. It's place. a way to reset. Yeah, you know? absolutely. I mean, I went. Um, like I said, I'm not an. I, I, I love to fish, hunting. Uh, I'll go, but I mean, I'm not like. Let's go to Academy and get the shells. I'm not like that. <laughs> but I love just going out there, drinking your coffee. And you're at peace. Yeah. Like, you don't hear it. You turn the phone off. All you hear is the pecans in the background hitting the, you know what I'm saying? Like, yep. it just, it's peaceful. And I, I guess that's why people say, oh, you're blessed to do what you get, you yeah. do. But, I mean, we are blessed. But There I mean, was a period back in April as a charter guide. We were really busy right before COVID. And mm-hmm. then when COVID started, everyone, nobody could travel. That was the biggest thing. It was the travel right. restraints. Once the travel restrictions lessened and we were out of quarantine, the outdoors industry itself exploded. Right. I mean, if you look at different, not just Louisiana, but if you look at state fishing licenses, hunting licenses, the number of women getting outdoors, just the outdoor industry Kids. just exploded. Yeah, I mean, everything. Yeah, because yeah. it was one place you could go where you weren't confined and you weren't thinking about it and you weren't, you know, Close to somebody that could get you sick. So, or I mean, strangle your wife and kids. Exactly. Sanity. <laughs> oh, how many divorces happened because of COVID? I mean, or babies. You know? Well, I mean, I, I got to admit, I got a little stronger, you know, on, yeah. on our match. I mean, you can you can look at it it's both gonna ways. It's going to go one yeah. way or the yeah, other. It's yeah, it's going to go one way or the other. And I, I actually look at it, I mean, I don't know if you guys look at it this way, but the pandemic was sort of a blessing. Like, it, it was an ways. eye open. Yeah, in some ways. I mean, it was scary, but now that I look back on it, I mean, can you guys say that maybe the show or some of the ideas that y'all getting ready to come out, you thought during quarantine because there were some things that was just going through your mind that you don't usually think about because you're in isolation? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, for sure. I, a lot yeah, of the comedy so. things that I came up with was during quarantine. Because oh, you got like, a lot of material I had to have. Right, to right. I mean, I had a lot of videos that popped off during quarantine because I'm... <laughs> I'm poking fun at the fact that we're trapped, right, you know, right. and you're you're in your own little prison. And I think it popped off that way. And I think it's going to rub off on an outdoor show like you yeah. guys have to say, hey, you don't have to stay in a house. You can go enjoy the great outdoors. That, yeah. that few weeks back in March, April, I guess it was April, because we went from in my fishing career, uh, we went from a fantastic March you know, t- huge tunas, epic year. People weren't e- people were blowing off COVID. They didn't even care because mm-hmm. the fishing was so good. But then April was kind of when it became scary and uncertain. And I literally was the mental struggles that it put on people. Being an outdoors person, I like I feel like a feral cat when I'm locked inside. Right. Like I don't want to be indoors. And when I didn't have fishing and we didn't have things to film, I was literally depressed. I was unhappy. I was stressed. Mm-hmm. I was like, when is this going to end? Like, I can't sit inside and do adult coloring books all day. Right. You know, I got to go do something. <laughs> I get in my kayak and just go. Yeah. There's only so many DJ Red videos I can watch. <laughs> right. Before I got to go outside and do well, something, right? <laughs> I was telling I was telling the guys during the, during the pandemic, I was I was out going outside and videoing like the ditch. And they were like, why are you doing that? And I'm like, because I'm so freaking bored. <laughs> But I would I would just get the right angles and I'd get the light and I was just like and my wife's like, Why are you videoing the ditch? I'm like, What else am I gonna do? But I mean, I, I guess what I'm saying is is it when I look at it as a blessing, you guys, me, we kinda got to hit the reset button and recharge and kinda look at things different and I guess expand on our craft as well. One I'm thing saying. I did a lot of during COVID was cook. I uh, did a lot of like Learned expi- some new things. Well, like, yeah, I took. I mean, I took ideas from people we'd met through our show because I didn't really know much about wild game aside from frying fish and mm-hmm. blackening fish and baking fish and 
tried to take things from prior guests and, and practice, and I, what else am I going to do? I'm stuck inside. So. Well, that's one thing I learned about well, like watching Bayou Wild TV is y'all kind of went from an outdoor thing, and then y'all kind of segueing into everybody how to prepare eats. it. Yeah, everybody, everybody eats. Everybody eats. Yeah. So, Not everybody hunts and fishes. Everybody t- eats. Tell me about that. Like, y'all get local, well, reach out to local yeah, people? Yeah, something that we kind of decided right early on is that we wanted to work in cooking to, if not every episode, as many episodes as we could. And we usually try to do it to where we're cooking whatever fish or game that we have in that episode, but it doesn't always work out that way. And uh, we're fortunate enough to partner up with Chef John Foles, who's probably one of the most prominent names in Louisiana cooking. Exactly. And he contributes cooking segments. We'll go to his estate there in Baton Rouge a couple times a year and do a day full of cooking, and he'll Mm -hmm. do four, five, six recipes at a time. Mm -hmm. But then we do also... Don and Martha do some on their own. Mm-hmm. Some of our, fr- uh, some of my friends. That some friend, you know, we'll have friends of the show that want to do one, and you know, what do you really see is everybody professional chefs. It, yeah, anybody. it's my all, mom's all done in between. One. You know, my mom's done one because she wanted to do her, her mother, my grandmother's recipe. She said, "Oh, I got a good idea for Mother's Day." I said, "Yeah, I like that. Let's do it." Mm-hmm. So, I mean, we we kind of take any anything anybody that wants to cook on the show, and right. you've done one. It hadn't aired yet, but we got you cooking. Yeah. On the show. Fait, yeah. Part of the beauty of just the outdoors hunting, fishing lifestyle that I love is taking what you, I guess people say harvest, I say kill. Yeah, you yeah. killed it. You didn't harvest it. It's not a fruit. <laughs> you killed it. And you then you cooked it. Harvest is a grain. All right. But some people think, I harvested this deer. No, you killed it. Yeah. <laughs> and you cleaned it. And, and you, you prepared it. it. <laughs> and that is one of, but that is the connection that brings people in. It is you so murder. great to, <laughs> it's so great to share, like, one of the things that I love, you know, not being a Louisiana native is my entire freezer is stuff that I have caught or shot. Right. Like, I do not go, I don't buy protein. And I, you know, I give it to friends and share it. And I love cooking for other people now. Mm-hmm. And I think that is just something that Louisiana, you don't have to be the one that caught it or the one that shot it to appreciate it but i think people that are like cooking is love i mean Mm -hmm. somebody that cooks you a meal of something that they you know went from start to finish on Mm -hmm. it's just when you put your head around that it's like it's such a connection to where you are right and i think that's what makes louisiana so inviting people to come here is because we we entice people to come here with our food and it's just we put like you said our love in it i mean and the love is called butter and onions That's exactly what it's called. and uh, lots of lots it. of it lots of it but and 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 the we're known for the place that we live in because you can just go like you said go in your backyard our freezer yeah. go catch some frogs <laughs> yeah. go shoot, shoot some squirrels shoot the squirrel right go, off the go, telephone exactly. pole and eat them and it, you know? it cracks me up my like my family up north doesn't get it they think i'm i was like they pay twenty six dollars for that plate of redfish. We just caught five and can feed thirty people with that. Like, uh-huh. Once you learn how to live off the land, you don't look at things the same way. No. When I had to go buy some groceries, I was like, oh, golly, like yeah. this backstrap I just cooked would have been a gourmet meal at so and so's, and that's exactly. just so much. I don't know if y'all do this, but every maybe every two three months, we'll go through the freezer. And we forget that we got the deer tamales oh, in the back, or yeah. we got the you know the the the, the deer burritos or yep. whatever we made, and we just have a freezer it's party. It's great, yeah, those <laughs> so, are fun. I don't know if people up north would ever have a freezer party. Uh, maybe I don't know. I wasn't into it up then, but I just know I don't like spending seven dollars for a pound of ground beef. Yeah, <laughs> you no, know, no, 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 no. <laughs> you rather go t- two two dollars for a bullet and put it down. Exactly. Right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I know in up more north part of the country. Deer hunting is a little more prominent. There's other hunting that's more prominent, yeah. but it seems like here it's the diversity. It's, every, is it's a diversity. Yeah. I right. mean, you can you can dig in my freezer right now, and I don't have nearly as much as she does. But right. I got flounder, I got pheasant, I got quail, right. I got offshore species of fish, I got deer, and all of this, like she said, sharing with other people. It's stuff that people has given to me because mm-hmm. I'm never the one with the fishing pole or the gun, but I always end up with a little bit of it from other people. So. Do y'all notice that when y'all go shoot uh, episodes up north um, versus down south? Do the, do, is it more, like I guess up north, is it more of like a, a macho thing? And where down here it's more of a, it's a living thing? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Um, do y'all see that? Because my, the persona that I get when I watch TV is down here, it's more of like living off of the land and we make use of everything. Like we'll even take the alligator teeth and make jewelry right, out of it. Right. Whereas up north it's more of like, 
look on my wall. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I don't know if it's just the imagery that pers- every know. hunter um, that's a that's a you know a true hunter is not just doing it to put a mount on the wall. So I think we share com- we have more in common than people down here may think to other places. I mm-hmm. mean, we bring we do these Cajun invasion trips specifically to show folks from here that we're not that different. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we go to South Dakota and they take their quail and their pheasant and their meals and they cook them for us. So I think we honestly have more in common Mm -hmm. than people would think, but we do have more of a diversity in terms of, you know, like there's a lot of things people up there, but then again, we go to South Dakota and they eat something called cannibal and it's literally raw meat that's seasoned. And it's like people down here are like, Whoa, it's like their push. version of hog head cheese. Yeah, and you're kind of like, what? Or faci- f- what they call that, fasishi or whatever, that fish that's kind of just... Oh, the, yeah. Sashimi? Uh, sashimi. And, well, not sashimi. They call it something else, but it's uh-huh. just it's just raw fish that they just let go in the sun, and they put a little mm. lemon juice on it, and they eat it like that. I don't know if I've done that one. But What, the, what is that? What is it? So the, I don't know. Um, no, the one that you're talking about. Oh, it's called cannibal. What What is it's, it? What is it made it of? It is... It's like it's ground meat. meat, but it is it's raw. It's raw, but oh. it's kind of like aged meat. Yeah, it's heavy. Se- yeah, salted and seasoned, and it's actually delicious. So, so it, it there's no like stuff that can actually hurt you, no, like because no. it's so it's just so aged cured, and salted I guess. and cured. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. Kind of like right. ceviche. I mean, everyone thinks ceviche. ceviche. That's ceviche, what I was saying. Yeah. Ceviche is delicious. People think it's raw, but it's cooked in the lemon juice. In and, the lemon yeah, juice, right? Yeah, it's technically the acids cook it, but basically. What I think is from where we've gone, you know, Alaska, South Dakota, Arkansas, wherever, um, every area has their specialty. But I think Louisiana, our specialty is our diversity, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Is it what, like, I'm not a very, you know, I'm not, I don't go hunt a lot and everything, but what is more, what what's popular down here as far as hunting game down here? What I mean, the number one, I don't see a lot of deer hunting. When I hear somebody say go, they're going deer hunting, they go to Mississippi. Is there a lot of deer hunting going on in Louisiana? Yeah, I mean, there is. There is. There's just not as many big deer leases and stuff. Like Turkey that. hunting is pretty big. Okay. Um, yeah. Small game hunting in Louisiana. Small game hunting and duck hunting is probably duck the hunting. most duck hunting. the most yeah. prominent. Yeah. Of hunting, although the duck hunting is getting kind of controversial. Um, With uh, ducks unlimited, maybe. Well, you know? just people have differences on the migration. Ducks are really coming here, not coming here, and. I got I'll tell you one thing. All that, one yeah, thing that's really popular. There are a lot of duck hunters, you know, up and down the flyway, which is from Canada to Louisiana. Right. Per capita, I think there's more duck hunters in Louisiana than anywhere registered or licensed. I would, okay. I would say one animal that's talked about less than it's actually hunted is pigs. I mean, wild pigs. Wild you, pigs. You yeah. cannot see a pig and not want to shoot it. Oh yeah. You just want to shoot that it. Mean, and it's delicious fun. Yeah. 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 You shoot them yeah. too. They're yeah, they're they're good. I mean, once you open your mind, like an animal might look kind of gross, but if you figure out oh, how to no. cook it, I mean, yeah, and, and that calls to mind another crazy trip that we did. One of our first episodes, we went on an airboat and shot wild pigs running oh, yeah. out the marsh and stuff. Our, uh, <laughs> that was our oh, Valentine's Day trip, <laughs> and yeah. it was her first time doing it. And oh god, that was fun. Chasing like, out like Rambo. Yeah. Out the there, only huh? thing more fun, I think, than an airboat doing that would be from like a helicopter. Oh yeah, yeah. oh but, yeah. I think I've seen a video where yeah, they, they do the helicopters. In Texas, and yeah. do it in Texas. So you can't really do it here. We don't have the landscape. Right. For it. But well, pigs, pigs are fun here because they're. There, there's no season. There's no limit. You can shoot them at night. You can use thermals. You can use scopes. You can use all kinds. Of okay, stuff. so there's no there's the least restrictions on oh, on pigs. All you need is a hunting license. Okay. Yeah. Well, they're oh, invas- oh, wild pigs. They're though, invasive, right? like yes. just yeah. like the nutrients and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They yeah not, they're not the cute little uh, not Miss the Piggy <laughs> ones. Leave Bil- Leave Wilbur alone and go these out dudes and have horns and stuff well, and look like one thing that really I, I learned <laughs> here is that everyone's like, oh, bringing home the bacon. You don't make bacon out of wild pig. They're too lean. No. You make them out of the fat ones that sit in the in that, the pen all day. Yeah, that eat corn all day long. Exactly. And they stuff the steroids in them, huh? But, I mean, a wild pig Jimmy is Dean, good. that's good. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no, but, uh, no, I I think it's great what y'all got going on right here, especially, especially y'all have, y'all have the luxury of going out of state. Tell me a little bit about that. Like, how do y'all pick that? You, does Don have people he knows, or does, do people reach out to y'all? Hey, come on, Molly's. Well, the majority... I'll say the majority of things that we do is contacts because of Don Dubuque because he's been doing it for 30 plus years. Right. So a lot of times her and I will have an idea and we'll tell him the idea. And within a couple of days or a couple of weeks, he has a contact to mm-hmm. make it happen because he knows everybody and everybody knows him. Mm-hmm. But yeah, the Alaska trip we call Cajun Invasion. Don's been doing that for 15 plus years. All right. So he goes every year annually 
and we promote people from here to go there, and they work out a package deal. Like a little tourism type yeah. thing. Oh, this cool. This was the first time. And that's the South Dakota yeah. started the same way, and it was actually some guys that we met in Alaska. Right. They were on a bachelor trip, the same lodge we're at in Alaska. Started talking to them and said, hey, we should do something. They said, hey, we got a lodge in South Dakota. So if you have something somewhere else <laughs> and you're interested in setting up a Cajun invasion, yeah. please reach out so, to us. You know, Dubai. The, the network, camp in Dubai. We can us. promote you and you can promote us. <laughs> the network of people, you know, an outdoorsman. And like she was kind of saying earlier, we're a lot more in common than you think. Right. So you meet outdoorsmen from all over the place and they kind of want to share what they have with you and vice versa. Right. That's one thing I've noticed, like, you know, I, I'm, like I said, I'm big into the fishing. I like fishing, but the hunting thing, it's, it's kind of intriguing to me. But a couple of years ago, I did, I did a MC event for a duck, a ducks unlimited thing in Homa that they had. And it's just, it's unbelievable. The people that like were at this thing and the gadgets to help you shoot a, a, a duck, you know? And I'm like, what? Like just different shells, different, you know, I, I don't, I, it's so much information I didn't know, but it's like, I thought you just put a bullet in a gun and shoot something, but every hobby, if you, you get further into it, you're gonna find more <laughs> oh, yeah. things you want. Oh from. yeah, well, I mean, uh, I do the video stuff, yeah, so exactly. I'm always finding stuff to put on my, right. you know, build my kit, so I could get, I get. Well, it. everything is marketable nowadays, yeah. so hunting is no different. Right. There's the next big gadget that's gonna put you. Here's over a perfect the top. example. I was watching a sportsman show. I was in Texas last week, and they were going spear fishing. You know, it's fishing, spear guns, whatever. Mm -hmm. The guy on the show used a game, a trail camera for deer hunting and was promoting it on a spear fishing episode because he put it on the boat saying, look, a lot of people, you know, we have all this gear and it's too much to move and it's too much to take off the boat. Put your trail camera on your boat. And then if you catch somebody that shouldn't be there, look, boom, you got uh, him. Got <laughs> I was like, that's pretty smart. <laughs> Quick little season six tease. Yeah, go ahead. On this subject of really... Technology advanced hunting. Uh -huh. We did a story with a guy who lives around Marksville, which is like central part of Louisiana, and he's a throwback duck hunter. He hunts with his own handmade Piro, handmade paddle, Borderline. a gun from the 1900s, mm -hmm. handmade duck calls, handmade decoys. So when every other hunter is trying to get the fastest motor and the $800 waiters and all this other stuff, mm -hmm. this guy's still doing it like they did in early 1900s and he kills just as many ducks as someone if probably not more right. than some of these other guys that have all the gadgets so yeah it's <laughs> intriguing i mean you'll find and that's i guess that's kind of another thing that we like with our show is we like telling those stories. it's also well, proof that you don't have to spend two thousand yeah, dollars to get into something right well and that's another thing i wanted to say you know you guys not only take you know your love for the outdoors and uh your love for cooking you guys t have a lot of storytelling that y'all yes. do. And then I remember the episode that we did, y'all told the story about the little ghosts that lived on the island and right. stuff like that. And I was like, man, this is awesome because not only are we doing a gator hunt and then they're going to cook a gator, they're telling stories about the actual place that we're hunting or at. Or the people. Or the know? people. Yeah. And I love that. So can y'all tell me some of the craziest stories that y'all have heard on the, on the trail of making these episodes? That was a crazy story. That yeah. uh, well, that was a a, a a a midget or a dwarf that died or something <laughs> yeah. on the on the. So, a lot of the a ghost midget. I mean, yeah. Talk, I mean, talking about stuff that goes back, the history is a big thing. Um, one of one of the good examples, I guess, would be, um, my friend Alan Steen, who he's in his sixties and he is a champion duck carver, duck decoy carver, and. When you take somebody's passion and you put them on an outlet to talk about it, you just learn so much history. Mm -hmm. And he talked about the people that got him into it and the legends of these older traditions, a lot of things that are dying out. And he doesn't, we, we don't want to see these traditions go away. Right. Um, he got so emotional talking about his national champion duck that he carved for a year and he gave it to his daughter. And it just shows just the, the connections to Louisiana mm -hmm. and the connections to the history of it. So a lot of these folks, you know, you can really, or talking about the, the, the biggest fish caught in Louisiana. I mean, yeah, that was a pretty cool story. That was, we, in our last season, we aired, we did a story on the guys that caught the biggest fish on record in Louisiana, mm -hmm. which was a 1200 pound yeah. blue fin tuna, which is very rare. Right. It doesn't happen very often. Four guys were on a fishing trip happened to catch this fish. Well, well, 
three of the four are still alive. This happened in, in late about 90s? 17 years ago or yeah. something like that. We sat all three of them down, got them individually to tell the story of the day they caught the biggest fish. Mm-hmm. And then so that was an episode, the biggest fish in Louisiana. So right. it's cool to hear that story from their perspective. It's not always always from our perspective, right. her perspective as a co-host, but it's from the, the person who the actual person, the two, yeah. yeah. You know, some of the other stories, too, are um, not just folks that remember the history, but the new generations of people doing this. Mm-hmm. I mean, Don's nephew is a perfect example. We haven't put him really on the show, but he is just, he's 10. 10 years old, yeah. And he's mm-hmm. obsessed, and he caught the um, the youth fish of the year. And other stories, you know, we interviewed a girl named Savannah Hendricks in South Dakota who's literally changing the laws up there. She's so passionate. She's 14, mm-hmm. and she's gone to Congress to advance, you know, the the hunting for children and, you know, one conservation, of our, all that stuff. Yeah. And, Extend the youth that's house, awesome yeah. how the youth like and I, I would feel like episode stuff that y'all doing are teaching these kids. All yeah, these and stories. One of, and one of our first episodes, we did a story with a boy um, from around Slidell and his dad or stepdad was in the military and he didn't have much chance to hunt, but he was in the hunting. So we teamed up with some other hunters and brought him to a place where he can go kill his first deer. And his dad wasn't there, but we were able to FaceTime him. He was in, from, J- he Japan, was in Japan. Oh, we were able wow. to FaceTime him when he was bringing the deer in off the full wheeler the first time. And he got to see it. So That's awesome. You know, that was a pretty cool moment. You That's know, probably got, worth the whole six episodes. Like, to me, stuff yeah. like that, like, oh, man. If I didn't make one dollar off all six seasons, that right there was worth it. One of, the, one of my favorites, um, it probably wasn't the most visually engaging episode, but for me as a trip that, you know, because we're building connections with the people that we're filming with. And we, Chris and I took a trip. What town were we in where we went to the um, seminar where the, the kids got their hunting and fishing licenses? Uh, Eunice. Eunice. Little tiny town, right. little tiny community center. Eunice. But, Eunice. The, but the people there cared so much about the outdoors that... I mean, they had a packed house of kids from about 10 to 15, and they had us as a guest on what they were doing. You know, they were getting their hunter safety. They were acquiring their hunter safeties through these seminars where they were learning fish identification, hunter safety through wildlife and fisheries, um, how to tie knots. And it was just so much fun to see that they, you know, just the simple things that get you started, Mm -hmm. that there were so many kids that want to do it. And something that, I mean, I've lived a lot of places, but Louisiana is a state where it's just... Kids are ate up with the outdoors. There's so much to do. They love it. You know, and when there's nothing to do, there's so much to do. Yeah, you know exactly. <laughs> and they belong, kids belong outside. And oh, I think yeah. I learned this after however many months, a month or so of quarantine. Yeah. And getting stir crazy in the house with my son. And I had a baby at the time. I had a, a newborn when mm-hmm. quarantine hit. So that was when you say it was kind of a blessing. Right. You know, when you have a newborn, there's a lot of visitors and guests and all this stuff. Yeah. We were forced for people to stay away, right. which was a good thing. But I was running out of ideas of things to do with my five-year-old to entertain him in mm-hmm. this house. I mean, we did everything you can think of. Chalk draw, water oh, balloon absolutely. fight, but <laughs> everything. So then when we were finally able to start going, doing things outside, and you realize how much more he enjoys the day and the time and how much better of a mood he was in yeah. when he gets to just go outside and be a kid and yeah. explore and play around in the dirt and all that other stuff. Too. Definitely. This kid's paradise down here. Yeah. I mean, right on the body side, boom, done. It's not just kids' paradise, but with the good weather Sports that we have. Paradise. Oh, yeah. Well, really think is. about the folks in quarantine that had to do it in, you know, 40 degree, 30 degree snow, and they literally couldn't be outside. Right. I would probably have to be medicated yeah. because I've made I it a, a point. Cu- I would have had a couple of bottles of this. Yeah. Oh, me. don't get me started on quarantine and booze. <laughs> but um, one thing that I have done consistently the last three years is spend at least a couple hours, two hours a day outside, whether mm-hmm. I'm just in my own neighborhood walking my dog or just something outside. Mm-hmm. You, if, if you're not feeling good, if you're depressed, stressed, whatever, go disconnect, go for a walk, leave your phone, in your house, go for a walk. Mm-hmm. Get outside. Go to a WMA. Go to the, the go to the park. Park. Go somewhere outside. You will be amazed at how much better you feel. Yep. I mean, just the fresh air and just being oh, with nature. Yeah. Like that's like, so like I was telling y'all. The cup of coffee, the deer stand, and just sitting in there, quiet, isolation, but outdoors. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? Not isolation inside, mm-hmm. in front of an iPad or uh, you know a movie or something like that. Get outside. Hit the reset button, 
smell the fresh air, enjoy nature. I you guess. don't have to that be hunting goes and back to, to what you talked about a little while ago and the storytelling and what we do with right. our show is you don't always go and catch the fish you want to catch nope. or shoot the animal you want to shoot. or But you have a story. It doesn't always work out. Mm-hmm. But, but you're but never going to regret that time. It's no. always an experience. Exactly. It always is. And I think that's one of the reasons why we enjoyed bringing you on is because we made it an experience. Yeah. I mean, and I think that's why a lot of people like watching, you know, you know, what Sean and I do with the Y'all Kitchen and what y'all do is because it's practical. It's not like we're not uppity. Like I was talking about, like some of those dramatizations, they make we're it sound like We're not trying to shoot a 200-inch deer yeah. every day. Yeah. You know, like, in a, like you got Godzilla, you open it up his mouth and stuff like that. I just, I guess I respect it a lot more because of the, the total meaning behind it. You know what I'm saying? Like you guys are actually pushing stories, pushing you know, adventures and making a difference. Whereas you got some people that just, they, they just do it just to do it. I you think know? ultimately our goal is to let people know that it's accessible to everyone. Right. And you don't have to have the best access. The I mean, one of our buddies who we just filmed with, who's going to be in our first episode, he doesn't have a deer lease. Mm-hmm. He's an avid hunter. He spent all season trying to shoot a deer on public land and I just saw him last week, and we traded Wahoo for king cake that he made. Uh-huh. And then two days later, he sends me a text, and he said, I shot Jolie a unicorn, and he had a public Louisiana land deer. Barter system right there. Oh, the Louisiana Trade Barter Wahoo system is fantastic. But <laughs> That's awesome. you, you can, you know, you don't have to find the expert. But some of the most versed people in the outdoors are the ones you don't even know about. Right. You know, the people that have some of the most incredible experiences, the best meat hauling, you know, the best skill, and they're not – on a social media page they're right. not on a tv show they're just in your own neighborhood yeah exactly cha-cha down the road mm-hmm. you know that's him and he he don't he, nobody knows him from his elbows he's forgotten or anything. more than yeah. you'll ever learn you know? exactly exactly <laughs> I and tell you, there's a lot of people that we run into that are amazing stories and they don't want the attention right, right. They'll turn us down right. oh I yeah, don't yeah. Be, i don't want people to know Dude, what I'm there's doing. this um, they're not necessarily doing anything illegal they just don't want to right down. right yeah. there's i mean but i mean you can make a story out of anything because i mean if you go down cocodry there's the Duplantis bridge by klondike when you turn right there there's an old house right there on the by your side and there's three guys they always sit right there and they're drinking beer every time you pass by I want to go sit down and interview them just because everybody knows those three guys sit down there. They've been there for 20 years. Mm-hmm. They got tank tops on and then they got their 16 ounce Budweiser. They're not sitting there just to drink beer. No, they, they, they're getting it there done. There's some interesting stories that are <laughs> yeah. going on they right there. They're solving the world's problems. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. They done solved right. it 20 years ago. <laughs> yep. They just here still drinking, <laughs> waiting for somebody to fix it. <laughs> but no, that's what I really appreciate y'all coming on to the podcast. Is there anything y'all want to talk about as far as like the um, the episodes brought, coming on? We do. We'll get to that, first, but we brought though. you a present. Oh, no. When we, when we talked about um, if some if people watching this podcast didn't see, we did the See You Later Alligator episode. All right. Look at that. And that's a keepsake that we brought oh, for you. Oh, awesome. Check we're, it out, We're going to yeah. put one up at the lodge, too. That was my first. Well, that that wasn't the gator I got. I think I got a little. Oh, the one on my back. That's the one that I that I took out. You mean I, your gym equipment? I, I had to shoot him like what? No, a I, sh- I shot him once, and I thought once. we got him, but then he kind of moved a little you bit, and we shot him again. Spot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but uh, th- this big one right here, I think I'll put thirteen bullets in him. Oh, that guy had to <laughs> pew pew like, him for a while. I was like, dude, we're gonna have to go back to the academy and get Texas, some bullets. Them Texas guys that were on a trip. Today. Yeah, yeah, it was they a whole like bunch of Texas lead. guys. <laughs> oh man, I like this man. This is yeah, awesome. So, so what? Which one we going on next? Nutri, you talked yes, about. Yes, we are taking you Nutri hunting. Hopefully, March. We're gonna look at calendars when we finish this. But we're taking you down to Venice. Shoot some marsh rats. Oh, you it's know? so much fun. <laughs> um, season and you're going to make a necklace out of his teeth, right? Oh, yeah. The big orange. Orange. Yep. 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 orange teeth. You're going to definitely do that. But yeah, no, Nutra, no doubt. We got to do that stuff. We got to cook six. it too. Season six. When Airs, does it start? So uh, Thursday. Well, it's, yeah, airing, tell, it's it'll, airing now. Okay. Yeah. Well, tell everybody where they can find y'all. Now, well, first of all, y'all can find us on LCN, the Louisiana right. Connection Your Network, channel. which is Cox 104 and Charter 150. Where else they can find y'all? A handful of other broadcast locations, but I'll, the easiest is YouTube. Obviously, right. anybody watching this knows how to use the internet. Yeah, yeah. Just, subscribe. Uh, go to YouTube. If you, you go to YouTube, 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 Facebook, TV. and all that. Uh, yeah, you know, all the other typical places you find right. the cool thing about the internet i mean it is great that we're on local television but youtube i mean i've had people in 
the East Coast. I've had my dad's friend in South Africa watch yeah, it. Yeah, it's the internet. It's the World it's, Wide it's the Web. World, yeah. I mean, I, I'll have people from Germany yeah. texting, I mean, uh, commenting on my stuff, and I'm like, that just blows my mind. Our main network is Cox Sports, Cox Sports Television, Television, and that airs in 17 different states. Um, we air primarily on Thursday nights and Sunday nights at 7 p.m. They often, they like us, thankfully, and they rerun us a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, if you don't have these ETEL, Char, um, Vision, LCN, networks, uh, WBRZ, WBRZ in, in Baton Rouge, right. Baton Sunday Ridge, mornings. WPL in New Orleans, all of our other broadcasts. I got you. Yeah, just go to your, your guide, type it in, and hit the DVR button, because sometimes they're random times. Um, but YouTube, it's always there, and it'll always be Every up. episode, yeah. every every promo. Plus, lots of cool bonuses, too. Yeah, like, yeah. So you can't put everything into a 30-minute show. There's right. a lot of cool stuff that we'll do extras on. Like, I just sent my dad. My dad's big into woodworking, and I just sent him the, the link that Chris made of, of uh, Dale Bordelon, who was the guy he was talking about with the duck hunting and the right. P-Rogue. And he makes and he's oh he's talking about his paddle. My the dad's art of in, a, the art of a paddle. You wouldn't think a paddle. Oh, there's not for a boat. There's my, a, like to paddle. Yeah, it? to paddle the piro. Oh, and my dad goes I like to craft it and to <laughs> use goes, it. He goes, I yeah. like his accent. He kind of goes into it. And then something else when you mention him, he did a demonstration making a handmade duck call out of a cane reed. Oh, well, okay. The whole demonstration took about thirty minutes that he showed us. Well, uh-huh. I can't do thirty minutes on a TV show. Yeah, you got to so cram watch, it into two minutes. When you watch the TV show, it'll be about three to four minutes. Uh-huh. But if you go to YouTube, I'll have that whole the whole demonstration. Yeah. On. One thing yeah. I forgot to mention that um, Louisiana also is cool with is art. Um, we've had several artists, whether through taxidermy, traditional taxidermy, unconventional taxidermy, taxidermy as art. Um, Japanese fish print painting, mm-hmm. uh, wood wood carving. I mean, there's a lot of like creativity, knife too. making, knife uh, making, yeah. and y'all starting to incorporate that into the. Well, it's the all episodes. part of it. It's yeah. all yeah, part of the wild brought into something else. Right. That was one we could probably leave off of this. There was one story that Don told me when we did the um, the last episode. This guy that made him a knife out of his feet. Yeah. It's incredible. That's nuts. And he told me the story, and I think y'all had that on one of y'all episodes. We hadn't you, we hadn't had a chance to work it in yet. Oh, okay. We did do a show with a knife maker. An 18-year-old. An 18-year-old from the Hammond area, LaRanger area, who was actually on that TV show Forge and Fire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He won yeah. it. And oh, so, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so we went to his house, and he showed us how he made a, a skinning knife. Mm-hmm. And But we Don also, that's when he mentioned to me, you know, I did this story several years ago for a magazine article. Of a guy that made a knife with his feet. He didn't have hands, and he mm-hmm. used his feet to make a knife. Mm-hmm. And I have the knife at my house that he made. We just hadn't figured out a way to to, to incorporate work it in. that yeah, in yeah. there. No, dude, y'all got to do that story. That was amazing. I'm not gonna give too much away, but this guy has no like, he has no arms or, or no hands or something, and he made no this, arms, just, no arms, just legs and feet, just yeah. like yeah, and he made it with his feet. I mean. I gotta see this. I have to. And uh, and we have a couple pictures. Don has a couple pictures yeah. from like the '90s or whatever when he did this story. Did that's it, all yeah. we had. It's the only content we have is a couple pictures and a story. <laughs> yeah, so that's I was it. I was <laughs> get creative and I was slide, a little let's nervous. Make a <laughs> Here's one thing to, that also sets it a little differently. I was a little nervous when we started that you know we'd get to where we are now a couple years down the road where we would be like oh no what are we gonna what are we gonna cover next Yeah. But when you start incorporating storytelling, you'll never run out of unlimited. Content. Now, you, you can go on a redfish trip with any captain on the sun, and it might look the same, but if you find something personal to relate it to, you'll never run out of material. Everybody has a story. Mm-hmm. And I Everybody. think what I really enjoy is we're starting to have people reach out to us and say, hey, y'all might like to do something. This might be a yeah. cool story for y'all to tell. Y'all might yeah. like to do that. And then kind of on that same note, I'm really enjoying meeting people that watch our show that aren't hardcore outdoorsmen. Right. They don't care about what line or tackle you're using or size hook or size shot. They just like the fact that we're telling the story about right. stuff that they know about because it's Louisiana. Relatable. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I had a mom recently send me a message on Instagram on our Bayou Wild page saying how much she liked the show. And she doesn't really do outdoor stuff. And you don't have to. That's no. the cool thing. Even if you're never inclined to get in a boat or get in a tree stand, mm-hmm. She said she enjoyed the program. Right. So there's content value Lift the to it. By I mean, the, yeah. just the visual aid, just the drone shots. Yeah. You can get lost in just the imagery of how beautiful the outdoors no, is. No, we would be nowhere without Chris. Uh, Hands so, down. so, yeah, I mean, you don't have to be an avid sportsman to watch a show like this. Just you can actually sit down and enjoy something. 
get to get to know something new, you know, and then get to learn somebody new to get to learn a story. But if you got people calling you with ideas, the half the battle's over with. Because so I used to yeah. I used to rack yeah. my brains, like you said, every time. The next idea, you have to keep your audience engaged. There's no shortage, and Don and I were actually on our way yesterday to go film something for a commercial, and we somebody called about an idea that he had been talking about, and then we were talking about something else, and we are looking at the schedule, and we're like, well, we can't do it this week, can't do it that week, Martha's fishing these days, and we're trying, I said, and I told him my exact words, I said, there's not enough of us to go around. Right. It's it not just, a bad problem to it, have. No, like, the not. ideas never run out, which is which is crazy. And Don's been doing it for so long. Mm -hmm. I'm always intrigued that he still has fresh ideas. After right. doing it for thirty something years, right. you think, you he, think he gets stale. He kinda gets stale, but no. no. I mean Don's a great guy, man. You sit down and he starts popping off this hey, this reminds me of this. This reminds me of this. Remind me. Talk about an encyclopedia of stories. Oh, yeah. yeah, we we one of our episodes on this new season, we went catch sheephead and we invited you with the the schedule yeah. didn't work out, but yeah. we had to catch sheep head on Lake Ponson Train, but we used panfish rigs, sackle jigging poles, something that you normally catch a brim with. Right. And we're catching four or five pound sheep head with it. And that was an idea Don <laughs> Having had. Fun with it. Yeah. And it was a cool to... marriage between, you know, someone who was a completely freshwater fisherman who's really not experienced in saltwater yeah. fishing. He got obsessed. I mean, <laughs> And that was, that was an that. idea. That mock crab meat with that oh, stuff, yeah. man. And that was an idea Don's been talking about for, I think, about two years to me. I don't know how long he's been cooking it up in his brain. Right. But it was, yeah, we can go fishing and catch sheephead. No big deal. But let's go have fun with it. Let's yeah. make it something more of an experience than just catch a fish, catch a fish, right. catch a fish. So, well, one thing I'm going to be doing, I'm going to do an episode for y'all catching. I don't know if y'all seen this, but I'm the idiot when it comes to buying those stupid things on Instagram. You know, when you're going through and they throw, throw the ball on the Guilty. ceiling and it sticks and you can't, I buy all of that stuff. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, one thing I bought was a magnet and you, you, you put a rope onto it and you fish with it. You throw it in the bayou <laughs> and you pull it in and whatever sticks to it, you pull it up. <laughs> I'm going to film an episode just doing that because Do it. it's different. I mean, Do why it. not? Just The so internet is Might filled. catch a body. You never filled, know. Yeah. Saw, you might try this. I saw the video several years ago, but somebody took a... Uh, like a little Nemo toy, uh -huh. and tried to go catch it. They were like in the Amazon or something like that, and tried to go catch a fish with a little Nemo toy. I just saw one that <laughs> goes on your beer can, and it's a little hand reel. Yeah, that you I saw reel that. <laughs> and I'm like, that's oh, not that practical, but I know someone's going to buy it. They cut, oh, somebody, I somebody bought it. Gonna, yeah. I bought two. Guilty. <laughs> no, I mean, everybody, they got the little funnels that podcast, come out. right? Yeah, you can, <laughs> they got these little funnels that you get, it's a koozie, and it turns into a funnel. You poke a hole, you, yeah. I'm like, man, they come, they real crazy with this, but. So, if anybody's interested in working with us, we're always yeah. open to folks. You know, we, we obviously do advertising. That's kind of our bread and butter. Mm -hmm. And um, if you have a business or something, please reach out to us because we love to meet new people. And, and they can reach out to y'all on the YouTube, Facebook, Facebook all that Facebook stuff. Facebook and social media. Uh, BuyYouWildTV at gmail.com. Okay. Um, BuyYouWildTV.com. Yeah, mm -hmm. we're we're always looking for folks to collaborate with and, you know, help us, help you kind of deal. You got a yeah. crazy idea. Like we're talking. We'll make it happen. Mm -hmm. I mean, or if you like you know, or if you ideas. want to advertise too, I mean, we we Chris is a masterful commercial producer, yep. and all this all the advertisements that are on our show, this guy produce and, them. Yeah, I mean, we've since we've started, it comes we've, with the territory. We've yeah. been working with the same people. You have to Louisiana Fish Fry, Double D Meat Products, the uh, Propane and Gas Association. Like mm -hmm. they they they've stayed with us, right. which CCA. is great. CCA, mm -hmm. um, just. The list of our sponsors has been so wonderful. So if anybody's interested, please let us know. Awesome. Awesome. Well, yeah. Find Bayou Wild TV on Facebook, YouTube, and everywhere at local channels, right? Uh, Sunday, y'all said Sunday about 7 o'clock. Thursdays, Thursdays, yeah. Thursdays, Thursdays, Thursdays and Sundays. Thursdays and Sundays. Sundays on LCN, Louisiana Connection Network. That's the one that I'm on, on uh, Cox 140 and Charter 150. And if so. you can't get to it on TV, just hit the subscribe button and you'll get you get notification while you hit the ding and you get yeah. notifications. So, yeah. well, I'd like to thank y'all for coming on the it's show been a today. Blast. Thank it's you. awesome. And look, I'm ready to get six dollars a tail. Yeah, right. All right. Let's go get the calendar. <laughs> yeah, we'll go get the calendar. But uh, thank y'all for watching the DJ Red Podcast. We'll see y'all next time. Let's go. <laughs>